All right, this is a, a little lecture that's accompanying chapter 13, which is uh, anatomy of the nervous system. And so, uh, first of all, I wanted to say a little bit about how we know about brains. That a lot of our early knowledge came from brain injury studies. Uh, guys like Phineas Gage, who you might have heard of uh, in psychology, if you took a psychology class, he was a railroad worker that had a tamping rod passed through his brain. And then uh, he was autopsy after he died and his symptoms were, were well known, studied by a doctor. And so then they could identify. And this happened with not just one or two people, but many people that had brain injuries. Later on, recently, uh, in the last 30 or 40 years, we have brain imaging studies where we can actually see what's going on in living patients. These include uh, using x-rays, CAT scans, magnetic resonance imaging, and positive emission tomography. And, and then you can actually kind of see what things do uh, because you can ask a patient to think about something or do an action, and then you can, you can see it going on in real time. And then, of course, we've looked at animal comparisons. Another way we know about brain stuff is studying the development of the brain in the central nervous system. Early in the embryo, uh, after the gut forms, there are three layers of cells. The outer layer called the ectoderm will give rise to the skin, but it also gives rise to the nervous system. Uh, it forms a plate uh, along the dorsal part of the, uh, the, the developing embryo, and this plate, part of this plate begins to fold into a groove and uh, this groove will become a tube and then on either side of this will be some neural crest cells. The tube is going to be the spinal cord and at the anterior part of it there will be three swellings, the prosencephalon, mesencephalon, and the rhombencephalon and these develop into the brain, uh, the forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain respectively. The prosencephalon will further develop kind of two distinct swellings. The front will be the telencephalon, and that becomes the cerebrum, the largest part in the human brain. The second part is the diencephalon, which becomes the thalamus uh, and hypothalamus. Um, and then the mesencephalon remains the midbrain, but the rhombencephalon, the back part, uh, develops again two swellings. The second one the myelencephalon becomes the medulla oblongata, but the the uh, the more anterior one, the metencephalon, becomes two larger structures, the uh, pons and the cerebellum. And so, and and then neural crest cells will form some of the nerves and other structures coming out of the brain. Okay, so we're going to go over major brain regions, um, and they're listed here the cerebrum, which is divided into left and right hemispheres, and then each hemisphere is named for the lobes or for the bones that lie above it. There's a frontal, parietal, uh, temporal lobes, and occipital lobe. The, hemis the cerebrum also has a layer of gray matter, unmyelinated neurons, called the cerebral cortex on its surface. It completely covers most of the brain. The diencephalon, you'll be able to see uh, in the next slide, which is underneath there, that divides into the thalamus and the hypothalamus. You can just see a little bit of the cerebellum kind of hidden away uh, here in brown underneath the temporal and occipital lobe. And then the rest of the brainstem, uh, the midbrain and the pons are pretty much hidden here, but you can see the medulla oblongata, which is uh, going to become the uh, part of the brain that connects with the spinal cord. Okay, here's a cross section. Um, there you can see the cerebral hemispheres and you're looking at a mid-sagittal view. So you can see uh, the diencephalon, which is normally completely covered, the thalamus and the hypothalamus. The midbrain also is covered, shown right there. And then the pons and medulla. The medulla you could see, the cerebrum you could just see. Okay, the cerebrum is the largest area in the human brain covering almost you know, almost everything else. It contains the majority of neurons. It contains all the uh, conscious processing areas. Our senses are kind of uh, projected there. 
our, our motor control is, is through there. Uh, the cerebrum, if we look at it in our frontal section, there we can see the layer of a uh, highly folded layer of gray matter. That's the cerebral cortex. And then the cerebrum, well, there's a deep groove called the uh, longitudinal fissure that divides it into a left and a right hemisphere. The um, underneath the gray matter are areas of connecting fibers, which are white matter, that will connect different areas of the cerebrum together. And then there are some nuclei inside there. These are areas of gray matter that uh, where we have function localized. And here they're shown kind of as, as you know, light green. Um, you see the striatum. These are, are all kind of lumped together as basal nuclei. And they're important in a variety of uh, areas in, in uh, motor pathways, and they're also function uh, in other ways. So here we'll talk about the basal nuclei. Here's a lateral view of them. Um, and they form kind of a ring at the base of the cerebrum. Um, and not only do they control motor function, but they're part of the limbic system. Um, this is together with the other parts of the cerebral cortex in the frontal lobe, and then the diencephalon, the, the thalamus and hypothalamus. These are involved in memory reproduction and the emotional interpretation of sensory input and emotions in general. Okay, so this huge cerebrum covers pretty much everything else. It's divided into left and right hemispheres. The hemispheres, uh, there's a crossover in there in the hemispheres. The right hemisphere controls the left side of the body. The left hemisphere controls the right side of the body. Uh, they receive sensory input from the opposite sides of the body. There you can see the longitudinal fissure. You can, uh, in this slide, you can see the different lobes, frontal, parietal, temporal, and occipital lobes. The frontal lobe contains lots of the um, motor regions. It contains the primary motor cortex, which specifically controls different muscles. The most anterior part of the frontal lobe, the prefrontal areas, is where our personality is. Our, our, many of our executive functions are located there. It controls our thoughts. Our uh, conscious memory and working memory are right there. The parietal lobe lies behind it. This is a, a sensory. It has the general sensory areas where it's receiving sensory information from different parts of the skin and muscles. Uh, and so it's, it's very important that way. The parietal lobe also uh, contains some auditory areas, which it kind of shares with the temporal lobe. Um, you can see these in, in the next slide. And then the occipital lobe has visual areas. Uh, temporal lobe has some memory areas, some auditory areas, some areas involved with smell. Here, let's go. Uh, there's the, these are the Broadman areas. These were localized, again, using uh, injury patients. Uh, it shows you the primary motor cortex, which is in the last part of the frontal lobe, and the primary somatosensory cortex, which is in the first uh, ridge or gyrus of the occipital lobe. Wernicke's area is the uh, part of the parietal and temporal lobe that deals with interpreting speech, so a large important area there. Um, Broca's area, another Broadman area, is deals with the area that allows us to produce the sounds of speech. Okay, so uh, cortex is huge, has lots of neurons, the majority of neurons in the brain. These are, their synapses occur in that gray matter and that's where the processing ability of the, the conscious brain is. Then underneath the cerebral cortex is the diencephalon. And so you can only see that in these cutaway views, the diencephalon, uh, this is the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the optic nerve there that crosses over below the hypothalamus. That's the part of the diencephalon. The epithalamus is also called the pineal gland. The diencephalon is extremely important, but it's not part of the conscious brain. Uh, it contains some of the most important areas as far as homeostasis goes. The hypothalamus is our main visceral control center. We've talked about it when we talked about body temperature. 
it's important to uh, homeostasis. Uh, this is an autonomic control. It controls heart rate, blood pressure, uh, temperature regulation, uh, food intake, water intake, control of our hormones, our endocrine system. Uh, it contains reflex centers for smell and is a center for emotional regulation. Okay, just above this is the thalamus. The thalamus contains a right and a left lobe, and they are kind of right together at the midline of the brain. And this functions, functions as an integration center. All sensory input, except the sense of smell, comes to the cerebrum through the thalamus. And the first processing that goes on is in the thalamus. And this thalamus kind of decides what's important enough to send to the cerebrum. Uh, it also interacts with other parts of the brain to control motor activity. And again, it's really important in uh, emotion and emotional control and regulation and things like that. Um, okay, so, so this lies completely hidden by the cerebrum. And then just posterior to this is the brainstem. The brainstem consists of three parts, the medulla, pons, and the midbrain. That's kind of posterior to anterior, posterior to superior. Um, this connects the spinal cord and cerebellum to the remainder of the brain. Uh, most of the cranial nerves arise from the brainstem. And none of this is under conscious control, but it controls many autonomic activities, many involuntary activities, um, and just any damage to the brainstem is, is very serious. Um, while it's not, doesn't do anything that's conscious, it does kind of activate the other, other parts of the brain. And uh, it has a, a critical part of what's called the reticular formation, which is um, going to activate uh, higher parts of the brain. And so it's re required for consciousness. And there you can see her in the bottom with her brainstem kind of highlighted in blue. And then here it's shown kind of with everything else removed, just sitting under the diencephalon. And so the midbrain uh, has two, two sets of bumps, the superior colliculi and the inferior colliculi. These are centers for auditory and visual reflexes. Uh, the pons winds up controlling some respiratory functions, a very large relay for sensory and motor information. Uh, it connects to the cerebellum, which is involved in motor functions. And then it connects to the medulla, which is, a, again, a very important visceral reflex center, important in heart rate, control of blood flow, uh, things like that. Then sitting behind these, attached to the pons, is the cerebellum which again has lots of gray matter, a highly folded surface. The cerebellar cortex sits on top of the pons, and this is where there's lots of uh, neurons and lots of synapses, and it lies on top of white matter, which is here called the arbor vitae. And that connects the cerebellum to the rest of the central nervous system, particularly to the frontal lobe of the brain and to these uh, motor pathways. The cerebellum is divided into three regions. Um, it controls balance, eye functions, fine motor coordination, uh, is involved in complex learning. It's what involves us or what allows us to do really complex motions and not have to think about it. Uh, when we learn, first time when we learn something like playing the piano, we learn it with our frontal lobes. But after a while, when you look at people that play really well, they can have a conversation while they're playing and their fingers almost seem to move independently. And that's because the cerebellum later on will co coordinate those complex motor activities. And then the, uh, those things will still be kind of run by the, the frontal lobe, but the cerebellum does most of the work. So there you see the things are slightly larger. Okay. All right, there's just a couple other things I have to mention. The brain is covered by a set of membranes called the meninges. The 
innermost meninge dips into the fissures and folds of the brain. It's called the pia mater. It sits right on the surface of the brain. Then there is a, a kind of network of fibers above it called the arachnoid matter. And then finally, uh, a, a tough covering called the dura mater that is kind of continuous with the periosteum on the inside of the skull. And lots of uh, base in the dura mater means there are some blood sinuses there that uh, collect blood that or fluid that's recycled from the brain. And so this completely, these meninges completely surround the, um, the brain and spinal cord, but they don't go inside. But there are hollow spaces inside, and that these are filled with a cerebrospinal fluid, which resembles blood plasma. And these, um, these, this fluid is produced inside some of these spaces. These spaces are called the ventricles, and there are two large ones, the uh, lateral ventricles inside the cerebrum. Then there's a, th a connection and a, a narrow third ventricle that sits inside the diencephalon. The cerebral aqueduct goes through the midbrain. And then the fourth ventricle passes through the brain, the remainder of the brain stem and just underneath the cerebellum and will continue in the spinal cord as the central canal. This cerebral spinal fluid that's inside these spaces is actually made by some cells inside there, uh, those spaces called the choroid plexus. These are ependymal cells and they uh, filter fluid from blood and they, they steadily produce the cerebral spinal fluid that flows out of the lateral ventricles and the fourth ventricle and then flows into the subarachnoid space. And so not only is that inside the brain, but is surrounding the brain as well. This fluid will be recycled at these granulations and it will be returned to the blood flow inside the dural sinus. And so there's a continual movement of these fluids that are gonna cushion and support the brain. So then in summary, the nervous system develops very early from a fold, from anterior swellings in a hollow tube Major brain regions include the cerebrum, diencephalon, midbrain, pons, medulla, and cerebellum. We can assign specific functions to very specific regions, but some complex functions like motor functions, uh, emotion, uh, awakenings, and things like that, that may be done by networks of structures across brain regions. And then supporting structures of the brain include the meninges, choroid plexus, and cerebrospinal fluid.